it's great that you can join us again this morning or whenever you happen to be watching. It's one of the great advantages of a, a video sermon. You can uh, grab your cup of tea and, and you can watch it whenever you like. Uh, speaking of tea, though, would you like a cup? Here we've got a nice clean mug, washed, ready to make a nice cup of tea. And you might well say, yes, all that would be nice. But actually, when I show you what's inside this mug, you might change your mind. You see, this mug has been carefully cleaned on the outside, yet the inside has been left rather dirty, which makes it pretty unpleasant to be used for a nice cup of tea. And that's actually part of what we're looking at this morning. This morning we are continuing our series in Luke's Gospel, and we get to this passage that we find at the end of Luke chapter 11, which, well, to be honest, is quite hard reading. It's entitled, Woes on the Pharisees and the Experts in the Law. And you may well be thinking to yourself at this point, well, that's absolutely fine because I am not a Pharisee and I am certainly not an expert in the law. But as we look at Jesus's judgment of these religious leaders, we need to be very careful that we don't write off these verses because we think that they don't apply to us. Because I think we actually all have a little bit of Pharisee living within us. Because actually we all like things to be done right, don't we? But actually that can be dangerous in itself. We need to guard against allowing it to, to govern what we do. If we allow legalism to dominate, we can in fact miss the gospel and miss the holy life that Christ has called us to. You see, these Pharisees were associated with God, but he was not the centre of their life. For them, God was simply one part among many things that they worshipped. And has that become the case for us? Let's read these verses in Luke 11 uh, and then have a look at the different issues that Jesus sees in the Pharisees. Uh, Luke 11 verses 37 to 54 says this. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs. But you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practised the latter without leaving the former undone. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing it. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, and you, experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourself will not lift one finger to help them. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. 
you yourself have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and to besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. There are six things, six marks that Jesus points out to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law as things that they are doing wrong. Maybe without even realising themselves that they're even doing it. And that's what we're going to have a look at this morning. We're going to look at what those six things are. And the thing that Jesus points out first is the issue of judging others by their standards. Verses uh, 37 to 38 say, uh, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Now, if we're going to understand this problem, we need to understand a little bit about the ritual hand washing that the Pharisee wanted Jesus to partake in. You see, this particular thing was an entirely man-made ritual. It was a tradition that had developed and actually would develop further in the future into such a formal act that a, a servant would end up having to pour the water over your hands because you'd have become unclean if you touched the container yourself. And the, the Pharisees had developed this ritual and, and Jesus hadn't done it. And as such, they judged Jesus. And judging others is a mark of a Pharisee. When man-made rituals are added to God's word, the traditions of man always become the standards and not the word of God. This Pharisee's man-made traditions had become so important in his life that he began even to judge Jesus. There's an old uh, joke about the fact that for most churches, even having Jesus uh, as their minister wouldn't be enough, mainly because actually he wouldn't do all the, the man-made things that we want him to do in our churches. So even Jesus falls short, as he does in this story of the man-made standards of holiness. The second problem that Jesus points out is the idea of looking on the outside and ignoring the inside. It says the Lord said to them, now then you Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people. Did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. This goes back to the mug that I showed you uh, right at the beginning, clean on the outside, yet filthy on the inside. And these religious leaders were more concerned with looking holy than actually being holy. Now, if we're honest, we probably want both the inside and the outside of a cup to be clean if we had to choose if we were going to drink from it. But the inside being clean is probably more important than the outside if we could only choose one. And actually, Jesus kind of makes the point that if the inside is clean, then the outside is going to be clean as well. So we have a Pharisee doing what was socially normal and being called a fool by Jesus. And here, quite simply, a fool is a person who looks the part on the outside. But in reality, they are certainly not who they pretend to be. And that question can be given to us. Are we more concerned with looking the part of a Christian or actually being a Christian? Are we as concerned with holiness on a Monday as we are on a Sunday? These Pharisees are very good at giving alms to the poor so that others could see them. And Jesus says, why don't you do that sort of stuff on the inside? If you practice true worship and true service on the inside the outside will also worship God. That's two things. Then the, the third thing is making less important things that are more important and vice versa. Verse 42 says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practised the latter without leaving the former undone. The Pharisees knew very well that the Old Testament tithe was 10% of everything that they grew. So they made sure 
that in order not to get it wrong, they would tithe even the smallest amount of herbs that they'd grown in their garden in order to be acknowledged by others and seen to be doing what is right. But Jesus then points out that they totally left out the main thing. If we have a works-based religion, then those works, those things that man has ordained as important, will be the most important thing to us. If we're told you can't have salvation unless you give 10% of everything, then that becomes the most important thing to do, doesn't it? But actually, Jesus turns that completely around. Listen carefully to what he says. He says, woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, rue and all other kinds of garden herbs. But you neglect justice and the love of God. You should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. He doesn't say you should tithe, but remember justice and love as well. He actually says you should practice justice and love and also remember to tithe. The insignificant to the Pharisees, the justice and the love, becomes the significant for Jesus. The significant for the Pharisees, the tithing, so that people can see how good and holy they are, becomes the insignificant for Jesus after justice and love. Do we ever highlight minor things because we can accomplish those at the expense of true Christianity? Have we whittled down God's standards so that we can accomplish them without his help? Maybe even to the point where we say we're a Christian just because we go to church and we give our tithe, which may or may not be 10%. Or do we say we are a Christian because our life is a life of justice and love, and the secondary nature of that is going to church and tithing, whatever percentage that may be. Moving on, number four, the fear of man in verse 43. Jesus says, woe to you, Pharisees, because you love the most important seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplaces. Jesus here suggests that the reason for their religion was the approval of others. They feared man rather than God. If you gave these men the choice between having a, a time of secret prayer or sitting in the front praying in front of others, then they'd probably pick that one because it got more attention. They loved the attention, Jesus is saying. They loved when people saw them and people admired them. For their religiosity. That's why traditions become so important to so many people, because they could work really hard and be really good at them and look very important doing them and be very religious doing them. They stood up so everyone could see them. They practiced good deeds, not because they were the right things to do, but so that other people could applaud them doing them. Do we care more about what others think of us or what God thinks? Jesus was unwilling to do the ritual of hand washing just to appease the Pharisee. He knew that true worship comes from a saved heart. When everyone knelt down to do some act that only made people admire them, he stood back and would not do it. Are we concerned about doing what's right by God's standards? Or are we more concerned with fitting in, being seen to be holier than others? I love the quote from Mike uh, Pilavacci of Soul Survivor uh, Watford. He says he doesn't take himself seriously, but he takes God seriously. And that, I think, is the complete opposite of these Pharisees here who, who took themselves very seriously, always doing the right Things, saying the right things, but they didn't take God seriously, doing what God had called them to do in Scripture. Our next issue is the, the problem of teaching uh, hypocrisy to others. Luke 11 verses, uh, verse 44 uh, says this, Woe to you because you are like unmarked graves which people walk over without knowing it. 
unmarked graves were uh, an issue for the Pharisees. You see, they had uh, taken the Levitical law about dead bodies very seriously and taken it actually one step further. And they said that actually, if you walk over an unmarked grave, you become unclean as if you touched a dead body. And so all over the city, people were accidentally walking over graves because they were unmarked and they were being told they had become unclean. But here we have Jesus declaring to the Pharisees that they are, in fact, like these unmarked graves. When people come into contact with them, they become unclean. They had become like a disease that others were being infected with. People came to these religious leaders for help and teaching, and they were taught untruths. Instead of leading people to God, they were leading more and more people away from God towards a works-based religion. And we need to be careful that what we teach is the word of God and only the word of God. Opinions and traditions are fine as long as they never go against the fact that salvation is by grace, not by works. Our final thing, our sixth thing that Jesus accuses the Pharisees of is making religion more difficult. Luke 11, 45 and 46. One of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. Jesus replied, and you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. And then verse 52 says, Woe to you experts in the law, because you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. Man-made additions confuse and add to what God requires. God has a set of standards that are found in Scripture, and these requirements of God's must be lived out in the lives of believers. Whereas the Pharisees had people who wanted to be near to God. And the Pharisees said, well, yes, you can, but you have to do this. But you have to do that. We need to be the people who strive for God's standards, not for anyone else's standard. So those are the things, very simply, that Jesus accuses the Pharisees of doing. So what is the remedy for this sort of hypocrisy? First, very simply, we realise that God looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Pharisees believe the lie that God sees man as they see. In other words, what they thought would impress God was what impressed pretty much everyone else around them. And they were wrong. God sees the true nature of our souls. He sees what man does not see. So we need to ask ourselves very simply as we draw ourselves to a close this morning, Is my faith mainly for others to see or for God to see? Do I work hard to impress other people in the church or do I live a life worthy of the call of Christ? And then secondly, to finish, we need to remember what we've already said, that we preach the gospel of grace, which very simply means that Christ came, Christ died for us, not because of what we've done, but despite what we've done. We mustn't be like the Pharisees. And how good are churches at slipping into being like the Pharisees? I'm sure you remember the old wristbands that you could get with WWJD on them. What would Jesus do? And it became a little cliched after a while, but actually it was a pretty good measure of the life of a Christian. Are we doing what Christ would do? How much of what we do is to be seen by others? When we're called to love our neighbours and our enemies and not neglect justice, that is what Jesus would do. Let's pray. 
Father God, it's all too easy for us to slip into Pharisee mode, to criticise and condemn others because they don't live up to our standards. May we live as those saved by grace, loving others with the love of Christ, seeking justice for those oppressed by the powers of the world. Lord, fill us with your spirit of truth to go into the world and bring your kingdom to the lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us again today. We're going to be back again next week as we look at uh, the opposition that Jesus faced from the Samaritans. Until then, may God bless your eyes with sight that you may see his face in every living being. May God strengthen your soul with courage that you may never fear the forces of hatred and division. May God fill your heart with his love that you may go forth to do his work of peace and reconciliation. And may the God of neighbour and stranger who was and is and always shall be with you bless you this day and always. Amen. Thank you.